Today on Applied Science, I'd like to talk to you about low F number camera lenses. That's right, if you're like me, you've always been intrigued by camera lenses that do really well in low light. And so the F number of a lens is the ratio of the entrance pupil. When you look down the end of the lens, take that diameter of the clear aperture and divide by the focal length of the lens. And this ratio will tell you how bright the image is that the lens produces. So most modern good fast lenses, a fast lens meaning low F number, is could be about F1.4. That's a very common uh, fast lens. The fastest lens ever made in a commercial production or used anywhere commercially is the uh, F0.7 lens used by Stanley Kubrick for the movie Barry Lyndon. And this movie was famously lit with candlelight with no external artificial lighting. So that's pretty fast, um, and you might have heard that there's a lens uh, f0.33 produced by Zeiss, but this is actually a joke lens. It does not function. It was made just for the hype because there's lots of low F number lens enthusiasts out there. But this is actually a working f0.38 lens. So let me show you how I built this. I've got an Ethernet-based single board camera from IDS here. And the reason I used that one is because, one, I found a killer deal on them on eBay. And then also I needed a camera with manual controls. Um, you can, through the software, control the exposure and the gain of the sensor, which is important for comparing images to other cameras. So I've got this mounted in a 3D printed frame, and this is carbon PLA to try to make it as rigid as possible. And then I've got a fine pitch uh, slide adjuster here and a kinematic mount with a microscope objective in it. And the kinematic mount allows the axis of the microscope objective to be aligned to the camera axis. The objective is pretty unusual. It's a 40X, so medium magnification uh, microscope objective, but it is designed for oil immersion. So it has a numerical aperture of 1.3. This is the type of microscope objective that you put a little drop of oil under and the oil optically couples the microscope objective to your slide. But in this case, we're going to use this coupling oil to couple it to the camera sensor. Now the challenge is this camera sensor has a protective glass cover, and beneath the cover there's a very thin slice of either air or vacuum between the glass and the sensor itself. And it's actually this little bit of air that causes um, the coupling oil to not be able to do its job. So we have to remove that piece of glass very carefully without damaging the sensor so that the oil can actually touch the image sensor itself and provide this optical coupling path to the microscope objective. Now I went through quite a few of these cameras. Um, this is a very low yield process removing this piece of glass without destroying the camera. I think I probably went through a total of eight I think and maybe two of them worked. I tried various different methods maybe gluing something to the top of the glass and then yanking upwards. And this kind of sort of worked, but um, it would leave the glass you know, not in one piece and then you'd end up having to pick the pieces out anyway. So the, the method that I found that worked the best was a little bit of heat to soften the epoxy that's holding the glass down and then to just push at it little by little. Uh, the thing we have to be careful about is inside that a bead of epoxy that goes around the perimeter, there's bond wires. And so if you lean on the epoxy or cut it away, all those bond wires are gone and there's, there's no chance it's going to work. I had a total of three IDS board cameras and then also was able to buy more of the image sensors themselves from DigiKey. I went through so many I knew I was going to just be replacing image sensors. And luckily I got pretty good practice at um, removing and reflowing the image sensor itself. So that was actually very easy compared to this glass removal procedure. Once I got a camera sensor with the glass removed and still working, I put everything together and added an infrared filter to the front, just because these sensors are so sensitive to infrared light, they make the image look weird, and then added a Makita battery pack as a nice convenient portable power source. So let's take a look at some test footage. We've got the f0.38 lens on the left that we just put together and my normal camera rig, uh, micro four thirds camera with an f1.4 lens on the right. So in theory, the f0.38 lens should be four stops faster. And we're looking at my workbench here with a candle. Uh, it's kind of a nice little token to Barry Lyndon there, but at least it's a candle, so you kind of know how bright it should be. And yeah, indeed, the lens is quite a bit brighter. There's no doubt about it. And especially when we look in shadowed areas, uh, you can really see those extra stops making a difference. The one thing that might be surprising is that the depth of field is huge. In fact, it's, it's massive. Like I even did some close-ups without me refocusing this f0.38 lens. 
Um, you can focus as close as a foot even, and that's as sharp as the stuff off in the distance in the shop. So this is a little bit of a surprise. I was kind of expecting, you know, super narrow depth of field with that, you know, dreamy kind of cinematic look and, you know, blown out candle flames and all that kind of thing. But um, the reason that it's not that is because the focal length is just so short. So this microscope objective has a focal length of about four millimeters. And as it turns out, the depth of field is very dependent on not just the F number, but also the focal length of the lens. So, so dependent on the focal length that even having a super, super low F number is not enough to make up for this very short focal length. So even though this implementation doesn't deliver uh, amazing cinematic performance, I did learn quite a few interesting things about uh, low F number lens systems, and I think you will be surprised by some of this stuff too. So let's talk about how I even got started with all this. In a previous video, uh, I used a large Fresnel lens to focus an image down onto a plant leaf and then developed the plant leaf with iodine. So I needed a lens that produced a very bright image. It had to be a low F number. And I said that I had this Fresnel lens, which was F0.5. And someone in the comments said, no, that's not possible. The theoretical minimum F number in air is 0.5. So there's no way that cheap piece of plastic is getting anywhere near F0.5. Okay, well, we can measure it. I mean, you can see that no matter where I shine into this lens, it, it is in fact being focused down and we can measure the lens and we can measure the focal length. And I said the definition of F number is the clear diameter, the entrance pupil divided by the focal length. All these things are very easy to measure. It's F0.5, isn't it? And in fact, if you go to reputable manufacturers' websites like Edmund Optics, they sell Fresnel lenses that are getting close to F0.5. So the deal is that to have a meaningful F number, the lens system must be free of spherical and coma aberration. So at first I found this to be a very unsatisfying requirement. I mean, it's sort of like saying all metals are steel except for the ones that aren't. I mean, okay. But, but here's how to think about it. If you have a lens that has a lot of spherical aberration, like this Fresnel lens does, then that means that some of the light rays going into the front of the lens are not being focused down to the right place. They're not contributing meaningfully to the image contrast. And so you could have a terrible lens. I mean, imagine like just a warped piece of glass. It's hardly a lens. You could sort of declare that the focal length is something. I mean, there's, there's kind of an image here. It's really hard to see what's going on. I mean, it's sort of there. But there's so many aberrations in this lens, it is hard to see that there's even an image there. So, you know, you could argue, well, it's the focal length is somewhere around here and the lens could be arbitrarily wide. It could just be a broken piece of glass or something. So I kind of get it. So there is a hard requirement that in order to give a lens system an F number, it does have to be corrected of spherical and coma aberration. So the next question is, in that F0.38 lens that we've been working on, it sure seemed like there was an awful lot of aberrations in there, at least some spherical and coma aberration. Does that mean that it's not really F0.38 because of this requirement? Yeah, I think the answer is actually yes to some extent. Unfortunately, there's no hard line between has aberrations and doesn't have any aberrations. And so if your lens system is not quite perfectly corrected, then that indeed means that the F number is not as meaningful. But as usual with complicated systems, there isn't really like one number that describes it. And to really fully explain how an optical system works, you basically just have to draw a ray diagram. The next question is why can't we just keep adding more lens elements to like crush more light down? Like we've got a funnel and we can just shove more and more light down to the next funnel and the next funnel and eventually to the focal plane. Uh, the answer is you can, and it does work. The only problem is it also makes the focal length longer. So it does accept more light into that huge front first element. Um, but since the focal length is also longer, it doesn't actually make the F number any lower. And as it turns out, the real limiting factor in what your minimum F number can be is the distance and the interplay between the final element and the focal plane itself. So imagine in the limit, if we really wanted to get all the light from this lens down to the focal plane, we could bring them really close together so that the focal length is super, super short and there's essentially no distance between the focal plane and the lens. And if we were to draw a point on this focal plane 
and then draw the rays coming down from this final lens element to the focal plane, we could get these so close together that it's basically 180 degrees, so that the focal plane is getting light shined on it from every angle available. And in that case, the half angle would be 90, and sine 90 is 1. So that's why a numerical aperture 1 is the limit in air, because you literally can't get any more light shining onto the focal plane from your lens. You're basically attacking it from all angles. Now we can see with this real-world lens that is um, f0.5, because we measured it, just ignore the aberrations thing for a minute, we can see that this lens is nowhere near numerical aperture 1, right? I mean, it has a focal length of about here. You can see the image forming on the card. And even though we measured the focal length and the diameter of this lens and got f0.5, I, I know that's not quite right, but it is, in theory, f0.5, we can measure the angle that this is making, and it's nowhere near uh, numerical aperture 1. So that also raises the question, how are these two things related, f number and numerical aperture? If you look around on the internet, you'll just see that it's 1 over 2 times the f number is numerical aperture, as if it was just, you know, a law. I also found this to be very unsatisfying. So I found a website with a pretty convincing geometric proof for how these two things are related, numeric aperture and f number. And we've got a lens here that's d in diameter and focal length f, and if we take the arctangent of d over 2 over f, and then take the sine of that, we have numerical aperture. N here is just the refractive index of the medium, and it's 1 for error. And so this website is saying that the precise value is actually sine of arc tan, but for small angles, tangent and sine are about the same. So you can just say sine of arc sine, which you know cancels out, and approximately numerical aperture is equal to 1 over 2 times the f number. So at first I thought, oh great, this, this solves the problem I was having with these weird f number Fresnel lenses. An f number of 0 0.5 for this Fresnel lens doesn't equate at all to numerical aperture 1. It's not even close. Maybe this is the, the reason for it, is that the exact uh, definition is different from the approximation, which is what everyone uses. So I plotted it out and then had another problem. <laughs> so here, here we see the blue line is the precise value from that website, sine of arc tangent, and we're relating numerical aperture on the y-axis and f number <clears throat> on the x-axis. The red line is the so-called approximation, so sine of, a, of arc sine, or really just 1 over 2 times the f number. And I could tell something weird was going on, because all these colored dots are real-world measurements that I took from actual microscope objectives. And wouldn't you know it, they all seem to fall on the so-called approximation line. And they have nothing, I mean, none of them are falling on the so-called exact line. So I did more digging around and could not really find any support of this idea that um, sine of the arc tangent is really the precise value. Everyone seems to say that 1 over 2 times the f number is numerical aperture, and that in fact is exact. So let me show you what I think is going on here. So it's true that there's no math or geometry errors going on in here. If this diagram is correct, then the formula is correct. But we know the formula doesn't really represent what we've measured in the real world. And if you search around on the internet, no one else is really saying this either. Everyone seems to suggest that 1 over 2f is the numerical aperture. It's not sine of arc tangent. So what else could be going on here? After a ton more searching, I found out that if you have a lens system that is corrected of spherical and coma aberrations, it's called aplanatic. And that plane in the middle, the principal plane, is actually curved. And this explains why that the true formula is actually sine arc sine, not sine arc tan, because that principal plane is curved, and instead of opposite over adjacent, it's adjacent over hypotenuse. And so then all, everything works out. <laughs> so I was kind of surprised to learn this, and I, I think it's correct, but um, clearly there could be a lot of discussion in the comments if I'm wrong about all this. But this would explain uh, why at very low f numbers um, the relationship holds. It's 1 over 2 times the, the f number is numerical aperture. And it also explains why um, the Fresnel lenses that seem to have low f numbers but not amazingly great numerical apertures are also allowed to exist in the world. It's because with huge amounts of, of spherical and, and coma aberration, um, 
the plane is flat and it's not curved and you end up with, it doesn't follow this relationship, it could be something else. The addition of this coupling oil is actually simpler to understand, I think, than all this other stuff. The whole purpose of that oil is just to match the index of refraction of that final lens element and allow a light ray to come in at a very, very steep angle. Whereas if there was air between the lens and the camera sensor, uh, the light ray would have to be refracted there and it would not be coming in at such a high angle. So it's really the, the purpose of all this is just to get as much light crammed into the sensor as possible and that oil just allows that final element to couple in a little bit better. So anyway, I knew we got kind of heavy on the math there at the end, but this kind of stuff puzzled me for a very long time and I asked optics experts and searched around on the web and read optics books and really was not able to put all this together for quite a while. Um, it's interesting how seemingly simple questions are difficult to answer um, if you don't have enough background information. Um, but anyway, I hope you found that interesting. And uh, you know, for, for future topics, I definitely want to build a large oil coupled lens. Of course, a lot of you are thinking, well, if this little prototype worked great, why can't we build like a large, you know, a, a lens for a micro four thirds camera with this same optical coupling and get you know a super, super uh, shallow depth of field with the high light gathering ability. So that's, that's on my list of things to look into and I, I think it's gonna happen at some point. Okay, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time, bye.